All right. Well, everyone, this has been uh, such a great day. I am going to just take a second to big, give a big kudos to all the organizers and, uh, and, and for facilitating some great discussions and presentations today. I've been learning a lot. And we are, we are going to do a final wrap-up discussion. And the way we're going to do this is... It's going to be a little bit organic um, because the idea for this was to be able to bring forward discussions and and points that are coming up through the day um, to and and synthesize them in some way here. So, but I can tell uh, the discussion I was just part of for the vegetation was excellent, and I hope that all of the breakout sessions have been the same. So we want to continue to have that opportunity for discussion in this final hour. So we're going to do report outs from each breakout group. We have our leads up here. And then we're going to open it up for more discussion through, ver through the virtual Mentimeter and, um, and just in the room. And then I'm going to try to wrap up with some cross-cutting points that have surfaced, at least for me, and through some discussion earlier, even yesterday, with the um, group leads here, and then we will wrap it up. So um, I'm going to go in order of the way these topics appeared on our agenda for a breakout session report. So we're going to start with Emma on physical habitat and water quality. Okay, thank you, Louise. Um, I'm going to turn around my paper. Okay, so. Okay, great. Um, sure, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, we spoke about the triggers option uh, today, and so one big thing we were talking about in the water quality and productivity group was, you know, pre-construction. Oftentimes, for our sites, we're not a wetland, <clears throat> so your permitting is totally different at that point. Um, you could say easier. And then post-construction, um, it's a wetland. <clears throat> and so the question is, how do you enact your uh, corrective actions? And, um, and so say we would like to resize a breach based on the water quality or the productivity, or um, you know, you have your veg treatments, if our FAV or SAV is maybe stopping up an area and preventing um, the water flow in or out. So answer those questions, but that's kind of where our um, discussion with the triggers went. Then we also spoke about sharing project goals. Oftentimes, sharing data is a big thing that we discuss, but the actual, um, you know, okay, FERP created Thule Red, but what, was, were, what were FERP's intentions with Thule Red? Any researcher can go there and do a project, but sometimes it would be informative to understand what our reasoning was. And so making sure that that sort of information is also shared in addition to the data. Um, and then we had a bunch of scientific ideas. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, <clears throat> DSC is here, and uh, they have the science action strategy. Um, there's going to be an upcoming proposal um, for funding. And so we spoke a bunch about the different topics that are at the top of the list and how they relate. Um, and then also we spoke about how tribal input, even after project construction, could be really um, something imperative to start to try and incorporate into our projects. Um, some of the future, nope, I didn't get to the next page. I'm on, paper, on, on the small paper now. Um, so for some of the studies that we spoke about, uh, flux studies, understanding if our sites are a source or sink of food. Um, and then if we understand that, maybe that could inform the restoration design of do we want the uplands to be flooding? Um, then we also were speaking about uh, def better defining primary productivity. Is our design potentially creating HABs? Um, and how that's different in the Sassoon versus the Delta? Um, and additionally, kind of looking down the lines of remote sensing and how that can better um, kind of aid us in being more effective or far reaching when it comes to monitoring water quality productivity. Thank you. 
Thank you, Emma. So we're going to keep rolling through and save our time for discussion. So jot down your questions or put them in the Mentimeter um, as we go ahead. So Rosie, invertebrates as fish food. Yeah, um, our papers are a mess. You don't want to actually read them. I'll just summarize the key take-home points. Um, we had a pretty broad-ranging conversation, but sort of the, the two themes that we kept coming back to is the number one was, what are the fish eating? Uh, do they actually care if they're eating a eel gamma or gamma? Um, maybe they don't. So you just like count the little scuds and who cares what they are. And um, a just wetland that produces one versus another we're going to be equally good. Or maybe it's really important and you need to pay attention to the different niches of these different things. So what are fish eating? We need more diet studies, which is difficult because many of the wetlands that are for listed species, you can't kill the listed species to dissect their diets. But um, if we could use surrogates, other fish species, uh, it would be really helpful. So that will get us to which invertebrates do we really care about building our sites for. Once we know which invertebrates we want, we have to figure out what those invertebrates want. What are they eating? Um, what types of habitat are they associated with? How do we build our site to produce that kind of habitat. So the rest of our conversation was on, you know, how do we design the site to produce the most of the invertebrates that matter once we've decided what those are. That included, you know, how can we um, use managed wetlands in conjunction with tidal wetlands to produce more food, and how do we design our tidal wetland restoration sites, both before the fact, to provide the right type of habitat and habitat heter heterogeneity to get the invertebrates we want, and um, are there any modifications we can make after the fact? This includes you know, controlling vegetation. Should we even be controlling vegetation? Or are some of the invertebrates associated with Egeria actually good for fish? Um, understanding that a little more. So those were the two like, big take home points is, what are the fish eating? And how do we design wetlands to produce more of what the fish are eating? You know, minor things like that. Uh, some of the other things we were also discussing were production rates. Um, are the standing stock that we're usually measure when we go out there actually indicative of um, high turnover or that's all getting eaten by fish before we can measure it? Or is it um, not very many bugs? And then is it all getting eaten by invasive species, or is it actually getting to the fish we care about? Uh, we also mentioned the fact that contaminants are a bit of a black hole right now. Not sure if they're negatively impacting um, invertebrates. Uh, also, what's going on at night? Um, we need more DNA databases, and uh, getting a better understanding of flux into and out of wetlands would also be useful. So short list, but. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully we can tackle it. All right, so we had a lively discussion and we filled out the appropriate uh, forms like we were supposed to, but also sort of had a free form discussion to see what com came up organically. And I think there's kind of three themes that we'll kind of broadly describe here. Um, first is maybe this seems simple, but maybe not. Um, meet it we need a more explicit way to describe and quantify uh, beneficial habitat instead of just, you know, potentially ambiguous criteria like wetted acres. Um, and a little side note, I don't know if anybody saw in the Los Angeles Times, probably a, a year ago or so, there was an article talking about, um, I think, Yolo Flyway Farms. And it was kind of tongue in cheek, but they were saying, is it fish habitat or is it cow pasture? And so, you know, there, we just need a better way to describe things instead of just that mean high, high water. I think there's efforts to do that. Just wanted to mention that kind of anecdote there. Um, and secondly, um, I think we came to the consensus that there's just no substitute for getting uh, some, you know, engaging multiple perspectives. Um, we had some, you know, really different perspectives from policy to research, researchers to practitioners, and that was made for a really fruitful conversation. Uh, one kind of anecdote that came out of that, um, Sarah Piramun, if I, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, from the Santa Clara Water District brought up um, issues with sediment reuse. And so sometimes you have too much sediment 
and you can't reuse that at a different site because of contaminant concerns and so on. And that means you have to like take it to a landfill. And is that the best approach when sediment is so limiting in the system and so on? So, you know, I think any of us could have read the whole internet and not been exposed to that kind of level of nuance in those types of things that actually affect restoration on the ground. Um, and lastly, um, you know, there should be sort of a priority to replace some of what has been sort of really great research and so on, but like a bit of a piecemeal approach to restoration design science with maybe more collaborative um, efforts, like a task force or something like that. And that would be important to be prioritized by agency leads and so on. So again, we went, I guess, a little bit askew from um, the questions, but I think we had some good insights, hopefully. I'm next, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so aquatic vegetation management was exciting, as I promised earlier in the day. Um, and part, part of uh, what we really looked at was synergizing some of the existing tools that state agencies have um, and trying to harness their power fully. And part of that was a discussion of something called a demonstration investigation zone that state parks has, but we're not using it synergistically with our state partners. Uh, so scaling up the approval of these to address potential new tools to be able to, uh, you know, deploy at these restoration sites. Specifically, uh, bubble curtains, if we were going to be using herbicide in certain spots to hold the herbicide in there to actually have an impact uh, with the concentrations. But again, the, the objective of the, of the DIS uh, collaboration is to ensure success of the restoration sites as it relates to invasive plant management. The second thing that we kind of came up with, or we heard, was there seems to be some, and we're not throwing anybody under the bus, but there's just the process of delayed approvals uh, on certain restoration sites. How is it that we wait two years, for example, to do something when we never hear back? In the meantime, the site was designed, it had plants put in that are quote unquote native, and then the invasive plants moved in. And then people are wondering what the hell's going on. Nothing's cleaned because uh, we didn't get the approval to do X, Y, or Z. So that leads to the third point, which is uh, early detection and rapid response. What is the plan in these sites? Is there a delta wide plan? If not, why not? We probably should look at recommending something like this. I think part of the other uh, th fourth piece or third piece um, is the creating a communication pathway. Um, we're communicating today, but uh, perhaps we need to look at this a little bit differently and the mechanisms. There are certain things in place now, like for example, the Delta uh, Interagency Implementation Planning Committee, I believe it's called, the DPIC. I think I had that wrong some, partly, but nonetheless, that approach is a vehicle by which we demonstrate whether we are doing adaptive management through the Delta plan. Uh, and, and are we communicating that out appropriately? Uh, so I think uh, I'll, I'll stop here with the fact that we also need to look at data sharing. We're not really looking at data sharing enough. As an example, um, projects for these restoration sites at CDFW, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Department of Water Resources, sharing it with, for example, boating and waterways to allow water, uh, boating and waterways to utilize some of that data in these restoration sites as evidentiary material to seek new demonstration investigation zone power to do different trials. So basically showing the science that's been done in these sites as evidence to why we need to have an adaptive management technique deployed. Um, and I think the last point I'll leave at is, is what level of weeds are we willing to accept? Are we going to get rid of them all? Not likely. So adaptive management has to recognize there's a certain level in the system we're going to have to accept. Okay. Uh, we, as the fish group, um, we had a deeply philosophical discussion uh, verging into the inevitability of distinct, uh, extinction and the heat death of the universe. So we got kind of maudlin. Um, <laughs> not quite that bad. But, uh, but we talked a little bit about, um, you know, uh, we had mm -hmm. talked about a lot of things. And so I'll just briefly summarize. We had a few, you know, key areas of scientific interest, uncertainties that we think need to be addressed to further management goals. Um, and those included, you know, really explicit and better understanding of trade-offs 
um, tied to different habitat functions. And as you modify design or you manage habitats in other ways, you know, what are the costs and benefits of these uh, management actions to fishes? Um, and then the other big sort of scientific uncertainty we identified were landscape level questions. So how do these wetlands interact with each other uh, and other habitats on the landscape? Are there connectivity issues that limit uh, the ability of a species to take advantage of multiple wetlands? Or is there transport of material from one site to another, et cetera? So thinking more broadly about these functions, not just within a wetland, but across wetlands and across other habitats, habitat boundaries. Um, we did come up with a super cool study idea, but I'm going to finish with that. So you have to wait for the next like minute and a half. Um, <laughs> uh, we also talked a lot about management. So, you know, the, the things that we're doing, the management that we're doing, what can we do to improve management for fishes? Uh, and some of it came down just to <clears throat> simple measurement, um, both, you know, making sure that we are monitoring the right things at the right times and that we're collaborating and talking with other people who might be monitoring, um, different things at different times in the same places. Uh, we realized that we had four different groups, four different people who represented four different groups who were all sampling in Thule Red, and they didn't know what they were doing. Um, which, you know, it was great. It was such a great conversation. But the types of things that we need to do all the time. Um, and then another aspect of this, of this management cycle is just, you know, c constantly redefining uh, our goals and making sure that they're clear and they're explicit and we don't have sort of nebulous outcomes because that can lead to nebulous management. Um, and with each of these, you know, the, the only constant is change. We talked a lot about, you know, how site development over time will change how that site functions. When is, when is, uh, when has a wetland been around long enough for us to decide whether it works or not, or is that a meaningful way to think about things? And then what does that mean in terms of natural variability? Uh, both interannual and water year, and then sort of these sort of broad scale global changes that we're all tackling as a society. Um, and, and what we eventually came to is that, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good from a management perspective, but it's also true for science. And we think we know enough um, where we could start, you know, doing some sort of synthesis where we can sort of spatially and explicitly synth uh, bring together a lot of information about function and start quantifying these trade-offs. If we built a map of places that, uh, like that uh, Chinook Salmon Habitat Quality Index that's just mostly tied to depth, uh, we built a map of different functions and made a super silly Habitat Suitability Index, uh, we could probably do a decent job bookending the scenarios, right? We're not gonna know exactly, but we could say with a pretty high degree of certainty, where is good, where is bad, and where are the high leverage places in between that would fill in some gaps? Um, uh, and I'll shut up now. Was that your study idea? Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. cool. Yeah, we have like a whole habitat suitability plan. Yeah. Awesome. We got sidetracked. Yep. Good. <laughs> all right, well, thanks so much for all those report outs. So I am going to, um, would like to see if there's any questions right now in the room for any, for, Really, it could be broad for um, for the whole topic we've been tackling today. It could be for any of our specific report out leads. Um, and I'm actually going to bring up the Mentimeter. So I'm going to navigate this on my computer for a second. Um, let's see. OK, so we're getting some things in the Mentimeter. And I'm not sure exactly which slide I need to be on. But here, let's see. Let me move forward. Here we go. We had a couple questions. And I think these were part of the breakout room discussion for key science action key science actions we need to take now to evaluate tidal wetland restoration. So I'm putting this up there to kind of prompt your own thinking. Um, and at any, any point, we can take questions from the room or virtually.
All right. I don't see any hands in the room. There are some questions online, and I don't know who will want to answer these. So let's do uh, just a real quick one. Uh, will PowerPoint presentations from the morning be available for download? We're going to try to make those available. We just need to talk to the presenters. So um, I've had multiple questions about that. Um, <clears throat> So here's an open-ended question. It sounds like some presenters feel there's enough information to manage tidal wetlands, while others feel we are just scratching the surface. Is there consensus among the tidal wetland community? And if not, where do disagreements arise? And does this impede progress on decision making at all? I mean, that's a big question. I'm going to just take a guess that there's not consensus, because where do we have consensus? But I don't know if anyone wants to tackle that. I can at least speak to it. Uh, I think Matt said it really well, and he said, we don't know very much, but we know enough to do something. You know, it's there's a ton we still don't know. I realized that the invertebrate groups High priority science action was find out what invertebrates we need and figure out how to make more of them, which is kind of like so huge to not really be useful. We had a more granular than that, but I think no one would say we know everything about tidal wetlands and we definitely know how to build them. Um, we, but we do know enough to try some things out use the adaptive management cycle to test our hypotheses on what we think happened or you know i, I think um dave was saying that like call it adaptive management call it a manipulative field experiment we just need to use what we know so far to build some restoration sites have good monitoring programs in place go back and learn from what we've done and i think we're starting to get there. We've got a couple sites, been in the ground a couple years. It's not enough to know for sure anything yet, but we're learning already. So um, I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to that. So I think the fact that we're all here, we're united. So that's <laughs> you know positivity first. Um, and in more positivity is that I think we need to make sure that the questions that we're asking are not are t really tied to the Delta plan, right? And you know, wear that on, as a badge of honor. What is the Delta plan? Learn it, figure it out, because everything we do is tied to it. Uh, let's not just go out and do monitoring for monitoring's sake. What is it? What the question is tied to the monitoring and the science. How does that improve Delta as place? Uh, we haven't talked about that today, but as a, a Delta Protection Advisory Committee member, that's a big deal for us, um, as it is for the Delta Protection Commission and the Stewardship Council. But what the questions we ask for the scientific endeavors should be closely linked with the Delta plan to endeavor Yes, there's restoration, and how does that restoration fit with the Delta plan? So I think the presence of us all here today show there's a massive concerted effort to be positive, to move forward. What questions we don't know, we will find the answers to, but we just need to kind of make sure that the plan, adaptively managed plan, is, is synchronous, is going on. Just real quick, I think there's a lot of consensus here, and obviously we can't have unanimous consensus, but I think uh, to take a stab at it, we just want to make sure that we're moving forward with the right objectives in mind and the right sort of goals and language and those types of things. I think that's what, I, what I've taken away from the panel and so on. And I'd like to add one thing, which is uh, something Eddie started talking about, is that we now have, I think compared to 10 years ago, more vehicles, even within our processes, for enabling experimentation. So Eddie talked about the demonstration investigation zone as a way in, within the permit for the invasive species program that he manages for boating and waterways. And that's a vehicle for trying different tools for aquatic vegetation management. Um, and that's, that's part of the actual permit. And so that's, that's new that there are now some regulatory enablers of adaptive management. Dylan talked about this earlier with the, um, with with the Delta plan and it requiring adaptive management. So 
I, I think that's another build and that we need to be using those to the fullest extent possible to bake in our learning processes. So I just wanted to add that. And I also wanted to note that what to what Eddie was talking about, the what are the questions that we're asking is actually something that is on the screen here is really need to determine our measures of, of success and, and state those clearly and then make sure we can actually measure them. So that gets to that point too. One more yeah. quick thought, you know, you're saying where we are now from where we were 10 years ago. And another thing we really have going for us right now is the fact that, you know, we're all together in this room. We have so many forums now for sharing science and yeah. sharing adaptive management um, through the Tidal Wetlands Monitoring Project Work Team, the California Estuaries Monitoring Work Group, um, venues like this. Uh, the culture of open data that we've been jumping on the bandwagon, you know, if you want to look and see what FERP has done over the past five years, you can go download their entire data set and see for yourself. Um, and that culture of sharing and all participating, I mean, one of the reasons why we had this workshop today is we wanted to find out what everyone was doing at Tuli Red and get those conversations started. So I think that will help us overcome the things we don't know and use everything we do know to act where we can. Uh, just an add on. I'm trying to give you a thoughtful answer, not a, you know, something glib. Um, I hope to, to whoever asked that question, I, I don't, I think, and I, want to, I don't want to speak for everybody, but maybe I'll speak for us. I don't think our intent was necessarily to um, suggest that we had a ton of controversy about whether we have enough data or not. Uh, we don't and we do, right? Like that's just, that's where we're at. And I think we are in a better position now than we've been as, as a community to ask better questions and to have higher expectations for our subsequent projects. And I think that that's just, it's a cool place to be in and hopefully we'll just continue that path forward. All right. Any other questions virtually, Darcy? Yeah, this one isn't really a question. It's more of a statement, but it, it could um, spawn some discussion. What was missing from today's discussion? Hydrodynamics. Matt touched on tidal prism. There's been some work already examining how different combinations of wetland restoration efforts will impact flow across the system. Any thoughts about that, anybody? I'm certainly no engineer, but Paul is, so there's that. Um, so <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that we brought up just superficially is, you know, um, the cost of restoring a site. So there's a the cost of digging channels, of excavating dirt, and so on. But there's also a cost of if you, you're, you're losing tidal energy in the system, uh, as I understand it. And so you want to make sure that it's, you know, the squeeze is worth the juice. And so you're getting enough habitat to sort of uh, make it worth you losing that tidal energy. So I don't know if that speaks to the question, but that's my sort of layman's understanding. And real quick, also not an engineer, but thinking about the cost, just remembering that historically the Delta was 98% wetlands, um, and I don't know if there's been anything on the tidal prism in the historic delta, but just something to think about. Yeah, oh, I gave it to you off, my yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah, I think there's been some, some modeling of the historic delta looking at salinity intrusion, but I think it's, um, there's some studies that, that have demonstrated that there is, um, there is a finite amount of tidal energy within the system, and it may be constrained by like carking and straits, for instance. But um, Dave's point is, is well taken because, for instance, um, um, among the restoration sites, there's a little Egbert track, which, as I understand, it's going to be a pretty deep uh, flooded track for a flood conveyance. 
and that could take some of the tidal energy out of some of these restored sites in like the upper Cashley complex. So I think that's important to understand, you know, how how these sites interact locally and regionally and like throughout the Delta as well. Anitra has. I just wanted to say that at least all the projects I'm aware of, they, they, we need to do, we do hydrologic modeling when we are designing the projects. And then we also have been, at DWR, we've had to do systematic modeling looking at salinity regimes by analyzing how those projects affect salinity downstream. So we actually have been doing that modeling and you know, it's, it's very difficult in this change system, but we're trying to consider those things. Okay, well, before going into some, Darcy, give me a flag if there's more questions coming in online. Or, or if, do, do you want to ask one now? Or? No, 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 no. This, one, this one's an old one, and it's a kind of a big question that was already touched on, so we can wait and go through some of the stuff here if you want to. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing, th so some of this, I think, is, pertinent to topics we have covered. Um, I don't see any new questions here. And then on the science actions, I'm seeing uh, landscape scale experimentation and a question uh, about synthesizing what is coming out of restoration, restoring hab today, synthesizing what is coming out of restoring today's habitat, I guess. What are benefits for salmon? What are benefits for smelt? Benefits for other species? I could invite any of us to comment on that if you would like. Otherwise, I have a question building on one of Rosie's comments that she made a minute ago. So not sure if anyone wants to comment on that question on screen right now. I see Matt. Uh, yeah, I could yeah. take a stab at part of it at least. Okay. I mean, some of these have been uh, assessed explicitly to some degree, at least, you know, as like the smelt life cycle working teams and uh, similar for salmon, a lot of these things do get looked at uh, conceptually. And the trick is, you know, quantifying it. It is difficult to quantify when there are a, a scant few individuals present at certain times and one is limited from um, touching them. So, you know, there are some major hurdles to you know, advancing the science with respect to the listed species use. Um, but conceptually, at least, they're relatively well addressed in a lot of the conceptual models for those species. Now, all of the other species could use a whole lot of work, um, too. But, you know, there we go. Thank you, Matt. Um, I have, yeah, no, thank you. I, it's very, it's a good point. So. Um, uh, the other thing, that one of the, the comments that Darcy raised from the virtual audience uh, about what was missing from today, I think that's worth exploring a little bit more. And one thing that I think could, could be something we could talk more about is climate stressors. And how, and I don't, I had, I will admit, I had to miss a, an hour of the morning, so I apologize if I'm not acknowledging some of the things that were discussed. But I, I also, I do think that's, we heard about Delta ADAPTS and the work that the Stewardship Council is doing. But for all of these topics, the climate and the, the fact that it's changing is introducing new stressors. And there, that seems like a big uncertainty and, and maybe one that deserves additional attention from modelers in terms of understanding and being able to predict potential changes in species responses because our the environment is actually changing and the potential for new invasive species the at, with the climate changing maybe it becomes more inviting or um, possible for newer species to establish and so we continually have a changing system that we're trying to do adaptive management on and i think that's worthy of some discussion if people have appetite for it i'll uh jump in briefly and say, first of all, you should talk to Danny Cox about his super cool analysis of wetlands as a thermal refuge for fish. Um, but that was definitely something that 
we didn't talk a lot about today and is a bit of an elephant in the room, something that in the invertebrate group we talked about in terms of our lack of information. We didn't have enough information to model changes with climate change because we don't even know the thermal niches of mm -hmm. most of the invertebrates. Mm -hmm. We know thermal niches for delta smelt and salmon and some of the other fishes, at least their upper thermal maximum, but there's still a lot of unknowns, especially some of these lesser studied native fish like blackfish and hitch and, you know, all the fun ones. Um, and modeling sea level rise, I feel like is a little further along. There's been a number of papers on that. Um, but I think the, the major driver for a lot of the restoration to this point has been we just need to get something done now um, because if we don't have time to wait 100 years, and yes, it might not be functioning 100 years, but we need something that will function now, so let's deal with the present right now. But I think we're getting to the point where we need to start thinking about what will the future bring in terms of temperatures, sea level rise, et cetera. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think what's missing um, to go on your theme here is on, on the vegetation side, I, we touched on it earlier, and I can't remember what uh, speaker spoke to it, but there was money that was being funded by the levees program. Mm -hmm. So climate stressors in, we're talking about resiliency. How do we have uh, the future state be resilient? So funding from levees and the levee programs is gonna be critical for vegetation registration, you know, restoration projects, um, I think. And so making projects resilient to climate impacts, but also on the vegetation management perspective, there's folks from my team here that can speak better to this than I can. But, you know, we're looking at growing degree days on invasive plants, in particular two, uh, curly leaf pondweed and agaria densa. They have different response curves in terms of when they're receptive to being controlled. So when I first started in this program almost 10 years ago, next year, uh, you know, we had a massive outbreak of curly leaf pondweed and agaria densa in Discovery Bay. We couldn't figure out well, why when we went into May and did our treatment, curly leaf pondweed did not respond. Well, it wasn't ready to respond. The photosynthesis process for that plant hadn't uh, matured to a point where it was receptive to the herbicide, but also the water temperature wasn't at the right uh, level, even though we were quote unquote in a drought. So I, th I think, you know, we are not in a drought now, according to the US Drought Monitor in this part of the California, but I think looking at what is missing is w what kind of science, and this, we didn't touch on this in my group, but um, what kind of science is needed? More work on the growing degree day units of these plants that we're concerned about taking over our restoration sites. What's the science behind that? We don't know. We've got some pieces of it, but more needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Did you want to speak? Sure. Um, kind of building on Rosie's point, I think you know we, to some degree, there could be paralysis or paralysis by analysis if we get too far down the pike with respect to climate change. But at the same time, you know things like flooded islands, because they are levied uh, as water gets deeper with sea level rise, uh, those shallow water refuge zones will disappear over time. And so as opposed to, you know, where you can access the marsh plain um, in terms of marsh transgression over time. So I think it's worth thinking, you know, taking some like first order look at how habitat might change over time. Um, and yeah. Uh, it's interesting to think about climate change and wetlands. I think about it in two ways because one, there's like the site specific impacts, you know, temperature increases, the value of the potential value of wetlands as cold water pools or not. You know, there's sea level rise talking about long term sustainability of the wetland. Is there space for the marsh to migrate upland or not? Are you going to wind up with these stranded, drowned marshes? Um, so that's, that's the site-specific stuff. But there's also the broad landscape level value. So I'm thinking of a species like Sacramento split tail um, that lives in marshes and wetlands and reproduces in river floodplains, you know, like the Yola Bypass. And so 
How are changing precipitation patterns going to adjust bypass inundation, which would then influence you know, reproduction, which would then influence how, those, how many of those fish are going to use wetland habitats downstream. So you know, there, there's a whole, what I'm trying to say is there's multiple scales at which to think about that question that are really highly relevant for species that move and are going to use habitats outside of just the wetlands themselves. Emigrating salmonids that are going to have, be struggling with uh, temperature issues in the river might like cold water um, wetlands if they're cold, things like that. So th again, multiple scales to think about those problems. Um, and I'll just add, I think, on the adaptive management end, you know, with all of our FERP sites already constructed, thinking about permitting and how do we adjust constructed sites with climate change, um, and then, you know, the permitting hurdle that would stand in front of us with that. Thanks, panelists, or group leads, for addressing that question on the fly. And I think we have a question in the audience right here. Well, I actually, I don't have a question. I was just going to add something to the thought of, you know, what was maybe missing today. Um, one thing I thought that we could talk about more, hopefully, when we do this again, um, would be incorporating um, tribal ecological knowledge and mm -hmm. science uh, to our restoration projects and, and the type of collaboration and real co-management um, with these projects. Thank you. That's this is great. I feel like the group is is summarizing the day, and I don't have to do it. <laughs> so it's great. Um, any more questions in the room or virtually? All right. Not seeing anything in the room. So I am going to go ahead and start a little recap, um, and then we will wrap up by four, which is just a few minutes from now. Um, one thing, I am going to move back to my slides, but I did want to say one thing that came to me as we were talking, and Rosie was making the point about how the communication channels have really increased over the last, I, definitely the last 10 years, but maybe even just the last six or seven years. I feel like there, the open data movement, the number of venues, and the opportunities like this one that we're having to bring people together is really great. And I wanted to, that that is a really important point. And I, I think that it becomes also the, the trade-off is that there's a lot of people have a hard time figuring out where to be and where to get their information. And everybody's so busy. Um, calendars are really booked. And emails are a hard way, a hard thing, hard, it's, it's just hard to communicate these days. Um, and so in Eddie's session, we talked a little bit about this and how do you provide information to decision makers so that it can be used, including for adaptive management and including for tidal wetland restoration or invas and or invasive aquatic vegetation. And there were actually a few points that, and, and that I thought I'd bring forward that we talked about. One is, the, the multiple multitude of ways to, of, of providing information is good because there's more likely that it's going to reach people. And you might need to provide information to decision makers, especially really busy people, in lots of different ways. And they won't all get through. Um, but maybe one will. Maybe one email or one conversation or one meeting or one fact sheet will land in the consciousness of a person that really needs that information. So that makes our job really hard because, oh my gosh, so we just have to do all these different ways of communicating. So that's, that's, that's true. It's, it is hard. Um, the other thing is that on the, we talked a little bit about on the ground experience is really important for people. Actually seeing what invasive vegetation infestation looks like. Actually seeing what it looks like to measure fish um, occupancy um, or water quality or harmful algal blooms. And so the opportunities that we have to bring people out on a, onto a site are so important for bringing some of this information home so that then when they're looking at a fact sheet or reading an email or having a conversation, they have this this landscape experience that they can bring back. Um, and then the other thing that came up in our discussion that was really great was 
sometimes we don't do a great job of consistent messaging. <laughs> Um, even as scientists, um, we, we don't always, we're not always saying the same thing. That creates confusion for people that are trying to take in the information in less than five minutes and, and use it. Um, or to guide some of their really important processes like permits for the State Water Project, for example. So, so that um, is where these conversations and this kind of symposium can be really important for helping us to consolidate the information and get to more consistent messaging. So that was just some thinking that um, I was reflecting on as we were talking just now. So I'm gonna go to a few slides that I literally made today um, and I need to get out of here, so how do I do that? Uh, okay, it worked, awesome, thank you. Um, these are things that are hard to do. <laughs> um, all right, presentation mode. So um, this, I, I wanted to try to leave us with some summarization of what we're seeing are outstanding uncertainties and needs for adaptive management of tidal wetlands. So this is very drafty, and it's not totally complete. Um, and I'm not trying to list every single one, but I tried to summarize in a way using categories. And um, we already have some categories represented by the group leads here, but that was too many for one slide, too many categories. So I went to design um, and thought about, because that's a really critical step in adaptive management, is actually designing a site and thinking about what is it supposed to accomplish um, and what are your tools for accomplishing that design and evaluating it. And these are the ones that struck me as, um, as rising to the surface, um, validation and expansion of numerical models. We talked a little bit about how there's a need for validation. There could be data gaps for the data needed for validation. And expansion, we talked about how we might not be modeling all things that we want to know about. So for example, um, what is the likelihood of occupancy of some of our invasive aquatic plants that we're trying to control, given different designs? Are we modeling that yet? I think that might be one that um, is still we still need. Um, refinement and expansion of rules of thumb for design based on some of the lessons learned that we're bringing forward through all the categories represented here on, um, at, with me at the front of the room. Um, and continued collaboration between scientists, modelers, and practitioners so that there's more opportunity for that. We really need to be building on that in order to inform design. And then there's been a lot of discussion today about real-time science input um, to design through phased implementation. So remaining, if there's opportunities to remain flexible in design in order to bring in lessons learned from say phase one or phase two to phase three or four of a project, that's, that would be real adaptive management kind of happening on a quick cycle, regular, um, um, relatively quick cycle. Um, and then I, what's not on here, but I do wanna say is that even within a design having um, opportunities to operate that wetland, uh, whether it's with a gate or something, um, that's one that's been, that's come up. Um, so realized function, I know that Matt right here represents realized function, but actually the water quality, because that's the name of your group, um, water quality and food web, those are all realized functions as well, right? So. Um, we talked a little bit about, Rosie um, talked about that there's more than um, zooplankton to the world of invertebrates, and we need to know more about the value of those taxa as fish food, um, and, and understand those taxa better. What are their suitability envelopes for temperature, salinity, um, turbidity, so that we know what, how they're likely to respond to some of the things we're gonna be measuring, and their densities. Um, wetlands and invasive species, that's been a big topic today. And how much can we live with? I think that's really important. Eddie said it really well. We're not getting rid of any of the invasive aquatic plants. In fact, we're just adding to the list of the species that are out there. So they're gonna be around, but how much, we don't right now have articulated goals of what densities are okay to deal with, where we can still reap some of the benefits of these wetland sites while while coexisting with some of these invasive aquatic plants and or clams for that matter. 
So how much to control them? Um, and then for invasive aquatic vegetation, what are effective methods of control? We heard a lot about limitations this morning from some of the tools we have. We had a great discussion about now there's more ability and space in our regulatory landscape to try different tools. Um, that's my alarm going off, Stacy, in my backpack. Um, sorry. So um, <laughs> it's in the outside pocket. <laughs> sorry. Um, so opportunities and benefits for oh, wetlands as part of a larger landscape. That's a great one. Um, uh, that we need to understand more about how these wetlands are communicating with communicating, um, interacting with each other and the role of the hydrodynamics there and how as we change the landscape, that interaction might be changing too. Um, opportunities and benefits of managed wetlands and then climate stressors and changes in species responses to restoration. We just talked about that a bit. Um, and then I wanted to make a note about some of this uncertainty and needs really, really rely in process and uh, how we are collecting and synthesizing information lessons learned to inform new projects. That's um, one that's been at the surface today. And then outstanding regulatory hurdles to adaptive management so that we can try new tools um, and that we can insert a science, science learning to the design process. Okay, so um, this is my attempt at some of the science needs that we still have. But a big overarching theme is adaptive management. And so I wanted to share some perspective and hopefully take home points or, or outstanding needs for adaptive management here. And then, then that's, this is my last slide. Um, I wanted to note that I still hear comments about how we're not doing adaptive management in the system. And I resist this because I do feel like some of, a lot of the, I, I'm getting smiles and I know that there's not agreement about this and that's okay. Um, I, I think that we have heard today a lot about how we are learning. And adaptive management to me is about learning. So I think we are doing that. I think we are adding tools to our toolbox whether it's modeling tools or it's invasive aquatic vegetation control or even our tools for tracking what's happening out on the system. I don't think that 10 years ago we had these predation event recording systems working as well as they do today and we're actively doing studies on some of these. So that's great. So we're building these tools into our processes and um, we heard Matt say, well, let's not let the perfect get in the, be the enemy of the good. We have enough information to try some things. I agree with that statement. And if we could think back to 15 years ago, um, and let's say, and if we were fortunate enough to have Larry Brown sitting right here, um, would he have been saying that we know enough to try something um, 15 or 20 years ago? I, maybe he would. Um, but I think he'd also be happy to see about, to hear the m amount that we've learned. Um, sorry, for those of you that don't know, Larry Brown is a, was an um, eminent ecologist that worked at USGS for a long time um, and is no longer with us, but definitely in spirit here in the room. Um, so uh, we need to keep learning to address our key uncertainties that we talked about just, just, um, just now. And then I really loved Dylan Chappell's uh, illustration of there's multiple gears and scales of adaptive management. So some of the reason I'm talking about times, time frames on the order of 10 to 15 years is because for some of these questions, that's the scale that we need to really address these, these questions in terms of overall efficacy of food web function and how the landscape is changing and then interacting the sites interacting with each other. That's, these are hard questions that take time, and we have to give ourselves that time. That doesn't mean that the, we can't do adaptive management on a more localized or shorter time scale for some of our more specific questions. And so there's multiple nested wheels of adaptive management that are going on, and that's okay. And that's how it's supposed to work, I think. Um, Regulation can be a driver of adaptive management if we're crafting regulatory processes properly and correctly. So um, we, that again, we heard about the Delta Ecosystem Amendment, the, um, the adaptive management being required. We heard about demonstration investigation zones. And uh, this is an opportunity, as any of us are involved in crafting a regulatory process 
build in opportunities for experimentation and adaptive management. Um, opportunities to incorporate adaptive management opportunities within project design. I feel like I'm becoming a little bit of a broken record right now, but but that's 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 what you do sometimes. Um, so so you've got we 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 want to be able to build that into our design processes, including with phased implementation, and then finally really continuing to sharpen the picture on what are measures of success. When are we going to say that a project is providing its benefits? We need to define those benefits up front. It's like adaptive management 101 and um, and then and then be able to effectively measure those. So that is, oh my gosh, it's 405. I, I thought I was going to see 358 on my clock, and it was going to be awesome. But I went over. Sorry. Um, there, this is recorded, and will the recording will be provided. The powerpoints are going to be provided, and there's going to be a white paper. And Rosie, anything else to wrap us up? Thank you all for coming and for bringing your best uh, game faces, participating in the breakout sessions, and generally having a wonderful time. If you haven't filled out the Mentimeter poll, please, you know, if you have some time tomorrow, you've mulled things over, want to add some thoughts, please do. We will incorporate that into the white paper. Yeah. And have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Let's give a round of applause to everyone, all of you for participating, all of our group leads and planners. And big thank you to Darcy and team for um, all the work you did to make this happen and the food. Thank you.